Okay, so now in this chapter, we are talking about uh, how to value the shares of ownership stock in a firm. And uh, that is one of the more complex uh, and, uh, and sort of sought after um, ideas in finance. Um, but the basic principle that underlies this idea is that the value of a firm is equal to the value of a share times the number of shares in the firm, what we call shares outstanding. Right. So that each individual share is worth one fractional percentage of the firm itself. Right. And so, for instance, if we had shares that were valued at, say, $100 a piece, and we had 100 shares outstanding, uh, the value of the firm would be $10,000. Okay. So this sort of basic underlying principle gives us an idea of how to come up with this number, which is what we're after in this chapter. How do we determine the value of a share? And this underlying principle, it at least indicates to us that there is two different ways that we can try to value a share. Uh, what I'll call the direct and indirect ways. Uh, and in the indirect way, what we do is to value the share, we first value the firm and then divide the firm, right? So first value the firm divided by the number of shares of ownership in the firm. And that gives me the value of a share. Where value here, of course, always means price, right? So the price of a share. Now, to do that, right, that means the indirect mean, the, the indirect way, meaning the what we value is the firm itself. And what we what the result of that process is, is the value of the share of the firm. Right? Now, the value of anything is simply the present value of its future cash flows. And for a firm, the cash flows that we uh, are interested in are the uh, cash flows from assets that we talked about in chapter two. Right. So the way that we value a firm is by valuing the present value of the future cash flows from assets. Right? Now, the issue for us is that we really only know two ways, right? Two ways to uh, value uh, cash flows uh, for a firm. So the first way is we can assume that the firm is uh, has level cash flows so let's say the cash flows from assets are 200,000 per year. And we can assume that the firm doesn't go on forever. And so we, uh, we simply assume that say it, uh, the firm resolves itself uh, seven years from now. Okay. And so then these would be the cash flows for the firm. Right. Again, I'm just making up a bunch of numbers here. Uh, this is the discount rate, 10%. So if we had a problem like this, we would know exactly what to do. The present value of these future cash flows is, uh, well, this is an annuity uh, that goes on for five years. Um, so we have the present value, want to solve for the present value of these cash flows. We have a payment of 200,000 per year. We have IY, that's our discount rate of 10% per year. And then we have an N of five years. We can compute the present value of this firm to be $758,157.35. So then the share price is 758,157.35 divided by the number of outstanding shares. Uh, 
let's just make it easy on ourselves and say that's a thousand. So 758, 157, 35 divided by a thousand is $758.15. Okay? So first we value the firm and then we value uh, then by knowing the value of the firm and knowing how many shares in the firm there are, we can we know the value of the stock. Now, there are a number of problems that you've probably identified with this. Uh, the biggest ones are that we have assumed that the firm only lives for, say, six years into the future, seven years in the future. And that is a very tricky and troubling assumption, uh, namely because we have no idea how long a firm can exist. Uh, I've told you that there are some firms uh, in the U.S. that are several hundred years old. There are firms in Europe and Asia that are you know, close to a thousand years old um, that have been doing the same thing for centuries. Right? So assuming that a firm is just going to end at some arbitrary point in the future is a very large uh, assumption for us because the firm presumably could continue doing what it's doing uh, for as long as it wants. Right? There is no set length of time that a firm can exist. Second is that uh, we have assumed that the cash flows from assets for the firm, the, the free cash flows here, are the same in all those periods. Now, we could have a growing annuity, could, so we could assume that those grow at a constant rate too, but here, at least in, the, in our simple annuity, we've assumed level cash flows. And at least in terms of realism, this is realistic is not realistic in the sense that we hope because of course we hope that if we buy an ownership stake in the firm the firm continues to make itself more valuable and it does so by earning additional cash flow over time right and just in terms of practical realism we just wouldn't expect that even a firm that was sort of at a steady state to have exactly the same set of cash flows in every year we would expect some variation okay so uh, the last thing is that we have assumed sort of a constant discount rate, and, and this is something that we're going to have to sort of put off into the future, talking about how to determine this discount rate. Um, but uh, So we'll put that off into the future. We'll have a, a whole chapter on, on talking about this, but uh, this assumption is also a big one, and uh, it, it's something that we have to talk about. Okay? Now, there's, so there's three issues, and I can solve one of those issues, by switching to the other type of financial instrument that we know about, which is the perpetuity, right? Where a perpetuity has cash flows that go on to infinity, right? And so even if we assume the same set of cash flows here, 200,000 per year, in a perpetuity, we assume that this firm lives forever. And the present value of a perpetuity is the cash flow divided by the rate. So 200,000, let's keep the same discount rate of 10%, gives us a value for the firm of 2 million. And then that would give us a share price of 2 million divided by a thousand shares outstanding or two thousand dollars per share okay so we've solved one of the problems and and actually this is a, a solution for one of the problems it is mathematically better we are going to get a closer approximation of firm value if we assume that it goes on forever than if we try to pick an arbitrary death date. So we value a firm more appropriately as a perpetuity than an annuity. But we still have the problem that we have assumed the same cash flows forever into infinity, which is even more troublesome when we're talking about infinity because $200,000 a thousand years from now is not gonna be worth the same thing that $200,000 today is, right? So there are, uh, and, and we still have a, 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 a a discount rate here that we have made up, but again, we'll push that off to the future. So sort of the main problem that we have here is that the cash flows are the same forever. And what that means is that, um, what our takeaway is that the, um, the indirect method uh, may not be the best method. Uh, it, it, uh, we make a lot of assumptions that may be incorrect. 
uh, in terms of valuing a share. Uh, and so where that leaves us is with a different way, with the direct method. And the direct method is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of valuing the firm first, we value the shares themselves. And then if we wanted to know the value of the firm, we could go the other way, right? So we value the share itself, and then perhaps we could multiply by the number of shares to understand the value of the firm. And this is only a better method, it's only gonna be a better method if the assumptions that we have to make about the cash flows generated by the shares are cleaner than the assumptions that we have to make about the cash flows generated by the firm, okay? So we have to ask ourselves two things. First is, right, what do I need to value the shares directly? And the answer, of course, is that I need the cash flows, right? The value of anything is the present value of its cash flows. So the question for us is, what are the cash flows generated by a stock. Right. What are the cash flows of a share of stock? Now, there are two cash flows generated by a stock. The first is dividend payments. Right. So dividends are promised to shareholders. You get a proportional share in the profit of the firm. And uh, the dividends are paid regularly uh, and they're announced. Um, so that's the one set of cash flows that, that you get. Uh, the second cash flow that you get is if you ever sell the stock, right? then you receive the price of the stock. Right? So if we look at say the cash flows of a dividend, and again, we're going to uh, value this here as a perpetuity, the cash flows of a share are going to be the dividends that get paid. So we'll have say dividend in the first period of a dollar, and then we'll have a second dividend, and we'll have a third dividend, and we'll have a fourth dividend. Right. And at some point in the future, we will sell the stock for $10. And so now we know that uh, if we have our discount rate here, that's not a dollar, that's a percent. Uh, we can value the stock similarly to the uh, firm itself as the present value of a perpetuity with some potential sale value at the end. Uh, now, this is only a better method if the assumptions that we make about the cash flows of the stock are better than the assumptions that we make about the cash flow of the firm. And um, they are, okay? Uh, they're, they're, uh, we'll just jump straight, we'll just jump, jump straight in. Uh, it, is, uh, it is far more likely for us to have steady dividends or steadily growing dividends than it is for us to have steady cash flows from assets or steadily growing cash flows from assets. So we are going to have a more accurate uh, model for valuing stock directly than for valuing the firm directly, okay? So when we value stock, or when we're interested in the price of a share of stock, we're going to do so by trying to calculate the present value of that stock's dividends, okay? Now, in chapter nine and 10, we'll talk about more in detail about how to value a firm. And so we'll sort of go, we'll reverse course, we'll go back to what we were talking about and how to make those assumptions better. But it's gonna turn out to be much cleaner and much better um, to assume that the dividends here of a, um, are, uh, or the cash flows of a share of stock uh, more appropriately follow the assumptions we need for the perpetuity model.